Exodus chapter 40, starting in verse 34. The Bible says, Then a cloud... Aloy, say amen. Amen. Okay. Then a cloud... Verse 34, you need to listen closely, Joe. Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And when the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the children of Israel went onward in their journeyings. But if the cloud were not taken up, then they journeyed not till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was upon the tabernacle by day, and fire was on it by night, in the sight of all, is of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeyings. And now I want you to take your Bibles and go to Numbers, and let's pick up in Numbers chapter 9. Numbers chapter 9, the very same account, but with a little more context provided. Numbers chapter 9 verse number 15. Numbers chapter 9, verse number 15. And on the day that the tabernacle was reared up, the cloud covered the tabernacle, namely, the tent of the testimony. And at even, there was upon the tabernacle, as it were, the appearance of fire until the morning. So it was, so it was always. The cloud covered it by day, and the appearance of fire by night. And when the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle, then after that the children of Israel journeyed, and in the place where the cloud abode, there the children of Israel pitched their tents. And at the commandment of the Lord, the children of Israel journeyed, and at the commandment of the Lord they pitched. As long as the cloud abode upon the tabernacle, they rested in their tents. And when the cloud tarried long upon the tabernacle, many days, then the children of Israel kept the charge of the Lord and journeyed not. And so it was, when the cloud was a few days upon the tabernacle, according to the commandment of the Lord, they abode in their tents. And according to the commandment of the Lord, they journeyed. And so it was, when the cloud abode from even unto the morning, and that the cloud was taken up in the morning, then they journeyed. Whether it was by day or by night, that the cloud was taken up, they journeyed. Verse 22 and following, or whether it were two days, a month, or a year, that the cloud tarried upon the tabernacle remaining thereon, the children of Israel abode in their tents and journeyed not. But when it was taken up, they journeyed. At the commandment of the Lord, they rested in the tents. And at the commandment of the Lord, they journeyed. They kept the charge of the Lord at the commandment of the Lord by the hand of Moses. This morning, I'm going to encourage you to follow the cloud. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to look at your word. We thank you, Lord, that your word is relevant. We thank you that it is preserved. And we thank you that we hold in our hands today the inspired word of God. And I thank you, Lord, that we still heretofore live in a country that affords us the opportunity to preach the unadulterated Word of God. And I pray this morning, Lord, if there be somebody here that needs this message, Lord, there are a great many people who have not heard it. There are a handful that have. And Father, no matter how many times I read John 3.16, you always give me something good when I read it. Father, I know what Romans 3.10 says. I know what Romans 3.23 says. I know what Romans 6.23 says, Lord. I know, I know large portions of the Scripture, Lord, but, but Father, just because I read it again or, or hear it again doesn't mean you don't give me something out of it. And Father, I pray for those that are here that have heard this before, that, Father, you'll give them a fresh oil on it. For those who have never heard it, we pray that you'd give them some insight into biblical decision-making. Lord, if there be somebody here today that says, Preacher, that if, I'm not sure that if I died today, I'd go to heaven. Then, Father, I pray that you would, through this message, Lord, show them that Jesus Christ is indeed the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man cometh unto the Father but by Him. 
Father, we pray you'd be with the Jenkins family, be with the rest of the families, Lord, who are on vacation. Bring them back safely to us. Blessed today, we pray in Jesus Christ's name and all God's children said. Amen. I heard a great preacher say this one time, and it was one of those statements that uh, impresses you, at least it impressed me. And I don't often write in the front of my Bible, except if they're statements by me. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, but I, I was very impressed by this particular statement. And I wrote it in the front of my Bible, and I want to mention it to you this morning. He said this, My life interrupts what God has planned for me. Let me say that again. My life interrupts what God has planned for me. And what that preacher was trying to say in that statement was simply this. Unless my life is totally given over to the leading of the Holy Spirit of God in every area of my life, then that unyielded life can disrupt and detour what God had originally planned for me. Evidently, that didn't impact you very much. But I often wonder how far along in my Christian walk I would be today if my life and my decisions did not interrupt what God had planned for me. I mean, you think, well, preacher, you know, you've been at this almost 14 years. You have the privilege of starting this work. You've got a wonderful family. You've got a home in Canyon Country. Uh, how much further along do you want it? I want it to be as further along as God wanted it to be. Amen. But the problem is, all of my life isn't always yielded the way it needs to be. We sing that song, I surrender all, but there are words on a piece of paper. We mean nothing. That's right. We sing, what a friend we have in Jesus, but he's only a friend in times of convenience now, isn't he? I often wonder how far along in my own Christian walk I would be if every corner of my life was yielded to God and my decisions did not interrupt what God had planned for me. You know what? God probably had great plans for Saul, but Saul's life interrupted it. That's right. My point is, we move when God doesn't move. Amen. And we don't move when God says we should move. Again, my life interrupts what God has planned for me. And this leads us to our text of Scripture this morning in the book of Exodus and in the book of Numbers. And I'll simply say, what is the text teaching? What is the text teaching? Both in Exodus chapter 40 and here in Numbers chapter 9, what we see here are, of course, the wilderness wanderings of the children of Israel under the leadership of Moses. And the Lord had instructed Moses to construct a mobile tabernacle. Everyone say those two words. Mobile tabernacle that would go with Israel through their journey. Now, I like that, okay? Because that tells me that your Christian life is not just something you set up in one place and leave. You take it with you wherever you go. Amen. Amen. Because that tabernacle represented a relationship. And that relationship went with them. And when that relationship stopped, they stopped. And when that relationship continued to go, they went with it. Amen. So the Lord had instructed Moses to construct a mobile tabernacle that would go with Israel through their journey. Boy, I'm glad that the Lord Jesus Christ goes with me through the wilderness. Amen. And to signify God's presence upon that tabernacle, both on Israel and, of course, the tabernacle itself, the Lord's glory would appear over the tabernacle by day in a cloud something we don't see here often in California, and by a pillar of fire by night. Boy, that must have been an awesome thing to see. Now, now, now think about this. Some of us have this notion in our mind. If God were here right now, and by the way, He is, Amen. but if God were here right now in a cloud, or if God were right here in a pillar of fire, I would make sure that my life would be according to plan. Seriously? You don't think Korah That's right. saw the cloud in the daytime and saw the pillar of fire at night, but yet he still wanted to rebel against Moses, which in turn rebelled against God? That's right. 
this notion that, boy, if God's right there with his hand right on my shoulder, boy, I'll live according to God's precepts. Let me say something to you. You snub your nose at God even though he's looking over your shoulder every day. You don't need his cloud over your head during the day and a pillar of fire at night. You snub your nose without the cloud there anyway. But to signify that presence, the Lord's glory would appear over that tabernacle by day in a cloud and by a pillar of fire by night. And what a sight that must have been. So long as the cloud remained over the tabernacle, the children of Israel were to stay put. That is, camp around the tabernacle. But when the cloud moved, they were to follow the cloud. Amen. If you will... Just to be crystal clear this morning, when God's presence moved, they moved. When God's presence stayed put, they stayed put. Amen. By the way, it did not matter when the cloud moved, whether it was morning, whether the cloud moved in the noontime, or in the middle of the night, they moved when the cloud moved and there was no debate. Numbers chapter 9, again, if you're right there in our second text, Numbers chapter 9, look at verse 21. And so it was when the cloud abode from even unto the morning, and that the cloud was taken up in the morning, then they journeyed, whether it was by day or by night, that the cloud was taken up, they journeyed. Listen, it didn't matter. When God moves, you move. If God's moving you at 1 a.m., you better move. <laughs> if God's moving you at 1 p.m., you better move. It doesn't matter, and may I say to you, God is not on your timetable. He is not looking at your little time X. God is outside of time, and He moves when He wants to move. Amen. And by the way, it did not matter how long the cloud remained. Whether it remained for two days, two months, or two years. Look at verse 22 of Numbers chapter 9. Or whether it were two days, or a month, or a year that the cloud tarried upon the tabernacle remaining thereon. The children of Israel abode in their tents and journeyed not. But when it was taken up, they journeyed. And can I say something to you? It doesn't matter how long the cloud remains there, whether it remains for two days, two months, or two years. If God's presence does not move, then neither did Israel. Right. By the way, you obey the cloud. The cloud doesn't obey you. Amen. And I'm sure, especially if the cloud was there for a couple of years. I'm sure people get antsy about things like that. Now, I'm sure the children of Israel, there were thousands of them. And they're probably coming up to Moses every once in a while going, don't you think we should move? Don't you, don't you think we should move? Yeah. And Moses, where's the cloud? Yeah. Is the cloud abode, uh, abiding on the tabernacle? Yeah. Well, we don't move unless the cloud moves. But yeah, but we've been here for two whole long years. I mean, what in the world are we going to do? Well, what if something happens? If the cloud's there, we don't move. Amen. If the cloud moves, we move. Right. But people get antsy. People get jittery. People start getting, you know, the little butterflies in their stomach like, man, been here too long. Going to have to do something. But I'm sure people were getting antsy about going. After all, we've been here for weeks. We've been here for months. We've been here for years. But if God's presence was there, you dared not move, even if you got antsy or thought there might be something better over the next ridge. Amen. Now, that's what the text is teaching historically. And I think it's pretty clear from Numbers 9 and Exodus 40 by the constant repetition that is there, that you move when God moves and you stay when God stays. Amen. Now, what does the text teach you and I today? Because obviously this was written to the children of Israel historically, but there's got to have to be some spiritual application for us in 2015 because we know that the Bible is relevant Amen. and that it means something to us now. Doesn't matter what the liberal theologians say. Doesn't matter what the, the preachers out there that don't understand God's Word say. I'm telling you the Bible is relevant for you right now. Amen. See, the lesson is simple. Christian, you do not move unless God moves. There it is. Let's have an altar call. That's the lesson. I mean, if you wanted a 45-minute sermon, come back next Sunday. But, but this morning, it's going to be rather simple. You do not move unless God moves. Amen. If you applied this basic Bible principle, and it is a Bible principle, to everyday lives, to your everyday lives, then most of your heartaches and most of your headaches would just go away. Yeah. 
or any future heartaches and any future headaches wouldn't come about. But do you know what happens with you? And do you know what happens with me? Your life interrupts what God has planned for you. Your decisions, your snap judgments, your knee-jerk reactions get in the way of what God has planned for you, Saul. Shame on you for getting ahead of God. Shame on you for hanging back while God moves forward. Allow me to make the application painfully obvious this morning. Number one, don't move from your job unless God moves you. I'll say it again because you didn't amen it long enough. Don't move from your job unless your job moves you. Unless God moves you. See, you said amen to the first one, didn't you? Katya. Anyway, listen, stop chasing the almighty dollar and stop thinking that things might be greener over here or over there. Stop obeying what your flesh wants and it wants everything contrary to what your spirit wants. Stop obeying what your wife wants. Stop obeying what your husband wants. Stop obeying what your kids want. Stop obeying what your company wants and start obeying what God wants. If God's presence is here, then you have no business being over there. It's as simple as that. If the cloud is here, then I want to be under the cloud. If the cloud's over there and it's moving ahead of me, I want to be in the process of following the cloud. Amen. You know what we'll do sometimes? Well, you know, preacher, I'm going to have to move to uh, outer Mongolia. Why? Well, that's where my job's going. My job's moving to outer Mongolia? Why would you want to go there? Gas is cheaper. <laughs> Uh, you ever heard people, I mean, they'll make up every excuse in the book for why they're going, except for this one. Well, God said to move. Yeah. Amen, amen, amen. I know a good preacher when I hear it. Somebody say amen. amen. Listen, man, I hear every excuse except the right one. Well, you know, gas is cheaper and housing is, I can get a, I can get a 3,000 square foot home over there for half of what you guys pay here. Listen to me. I don't care if I'm in a shack as long as I'm where the cloud is. I don't care. And you need to have that idea yourself that you are not owed anything by God besides salvation and even that was a gift of God. This notion that, well, you know, I'm living the American dream and I should have a 3,000 square foot home and I should have four cars that are paid for by the U.S. government and, you know, and, and all this stuff. You deserve squat, my friend. That's right. But I'll tell you what you need to do. You need to be where the cloud is. Because I'd rather be poor where the cloud is than rich where the cloud isn't. Amen. I'd rather be right in the middle of God, not having much in my bank account, and I don't. And not having much for cars, and I don't. And not having much for a whole lot of things, and I don't. But that's okay. This world's not my home anyway. Amen. When I die, I won't miss much. Amen? <laughs> Don't move from your job unless God moves you. But what happens is we start logically thinking, well, everything should be better over here. Don't move unless God moves you. Number two, don't move from your church unless God moves you. You don't leave a church because the pastor preached against Santa Claus. Now you laugh, but we've had at least one person, one family, I think, were a little upset about a sermon that I preached years ago in my youth. And all I basically said was, my wife and I don't teach our kid about Santa Claus. Now, we tell them that there's a guy that's got a red beard, and we watch White Christmas every year, so Bing Crosby and Danny Kaye are part of our family. You know, we do all that stuff. It's wonderful. But we don't teach them that because we buy the gifts. I don't want a man in a red suit to get any credit for what we did. Now, if, if you put, you know, from Santa, it's, that's between you. That's fine. I don't care what you do. This is what we do. Family got upset with us and thought that was 
How dare you preach against sin? Can you imagine them going to another church and they say, what would you guys leave Freedom's Way for? Was it because they didn't preach against inspiration of the Bible? Oh, no. No. Did they, did they not preach against the... Did they, did they talk against the deity of Christ? No, 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 not that. Oh, they, they must have been preaching on tongues or something like that. And they, no, what'd you leave for? Preach against Santa Claus. <laughs> you don't leave a church because the pastor preaches hard against alcohol. Amen. I had two people in this, in this church. They weren't necessarily members of this church, but they were coming. And they, they didn't even leave, didn't even do the decency of listening to all three sermons on the subject of alcohol. Now, I don't drink alcohol. I don't. Now, let me, let me rephrase that. I do drink medicinal alcohol. <laughs> All right? Every once in a while, i got to have a swig of NyQuil. Why? To put up with Tim LeMaster. But the fact is... <laughs> no, I'm just telling you, folks. There, you, there's alcohol and stuff, you know. I remember going to a, a dinner one time with my wife, and it was another pastor friend of mine. And this pastor is definitely more conservative than me in certain areas. And I remember we went to an Italian restaurant, and my wife wanted a particular meal that had white wine in it, yeah. you know. Well, we all know, I would hope, that the alcohol cooks out and it just leaves a flavor, right? Okay, we're all good with that. But this other pastor ordered the same exact meal as my wife did and said, oh, by the way, I don't want any wine in it. <laughs> God bless you. But anyway, but the fact is, folks, but here's, here's what this, I thought to myself, oh, I think the pastor was chastising you, honey, so I kicked her in the leg a little bit. But, uh, but, but no, no. Uh, but listen, we walked out. My wife walked out sober. Yeah. We were just fine. <laughs> it just her meal tasted better than his. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> okay. But listen, so two, two people got all upset because I said that I do not personally drink alcohol. I don't. I wasn't encouraging anyone to follow me. I just simply said, what does the Word of God say? Go with what the Word of God says. Amen. People left. All upset, just in a flutter. Why? Well, that church over there, the pastor doesn't drink any beer. <laughs> You don't leave a church because you can't get along with a brother or a sister. You work things out like that and stick with it. Amen. I hate this stuff like, well, I'm not going to go there anymore. Why? Well, I can't get along with brother so-and-so. I can't get along with you half the time, but I show up anyway. <laughs> Honest to goodness. We're all different people here, different ethnic groups, different temperaments, you know. Man, you want to see things? Go to a preacher's meeting and see how they try to, hey, brother, how's it going? In reality, it's like, <laughs> you know, seriously. Preachers, man, oh, man, they put on the happy face. How things, oh, we're running 3,000. <laughs> I'm only running 30. You know, I mean, the jealousy and envy and all that. You know how that goes, preacher. Now, we're going to have a preacher's meeting here in a couple, uh, a few weeks. I sure hope none of that spirit's there, but it could be. Who knows? But I'm just telling you, folks, you don't leave a church because you can't get along with brother or sister so-and-so. You work it out like Christians and stick with the church body. God gave you a manual of how to deal with people. Yeah. We're all equal at the foot of the cross. You don't leave a church because the church down the street has a better children's program. You know what you're doing? You're listening to your kids. You don't know how many linguine spine husbands I've met with backbones of spaghetti noodles that have said, well, I'd like to come here, but my kids like the program over here. I'm like, well, how's the preaching? Uh. So you're willing to give up the most important part of your service to the Lord for the sake of a camp out? Yeah. Amen. Now, we've got a few ki kids program here, but we don't major on that stuff. We don't major on that. And, and, and listen, even if we get out of this building and grow even more than we have grown, that's not going to be what we major on. I'm not saying we're not going to have anything for kids, but that's not what we're going to major on. See, the priority of the service should be the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God. And if the church that you're attending is not primary in that area, you have no business there. Yes, if the cloud isn't there, you have no business being there. Amen. You don't leave a church because the church down the street has a better children's program. Or you don't, you don't leave church to the church down the street because they have a worship band or a Christian rap group. Well, preacher, you know, I'd, I'd like to go to Freedom's Way. The preaching's great, but, you know, Pastor Dan doesn't rap. <laughs> I have a hard time with English. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. 
what that means. I, I just know this. I don't even know what Christian rap is. I know that there are some of you that like that kind of stuff. If, it, if that's the case, please keep it away from me as far as you can. But I'm just simply saying, I'm not going to have no Christian rappers up here. It's not going to happen. If anything, I'll just rap something. You know? In the beginning, God created... You know, I don't know that... Oh, that was so white! The only reason... The, the, the only reason you leave a church is if the Lord's left it. There was a statement in the Old Testament. The word was Ichabod, which means the glory of the Lord hath departed. If the church has Ichabod, you don't go to Ichabod First Baptist Church. You don't go there. You go to the church where the glory of the Lord is. Amen. The only reason you leave a church is if the Lord has left it. If God's presence has moved on, then that church is, at the, is the last place you want to find yourself in. You stay when God sta says stay, and you move when God moves. You don't run your life. God does, or at least He should. Every decision you make should be bathed in prayer and should not be just some knee-jerk reaction in the moment. Every person you befriend should get God's approval first. Yes. The Apostle Paul reminded us in 1 Corinthians 6, you don't need to turn there, quote, You are not your own. You have been bought with a price. Right. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. Amen. If that's true and it is, then follow the cloud, not how you feel. Amen. I'm going to tell you right now, there's sometimes you won't feel like being in church. Heck, I got up this morning thinking, man, I'm really comfortable in this weird, awkward position in bed. <laughs> but I was comfortable anyway. <laughs> but I got up. I don't feel like it sometimes. I may not even feel like coming back tonight, but guess what? I'm going to come back. Why? i got to finish out the Ten Commandments tonight. Amen. Why? Because I want to preach to you a willy on thou shalt not covet. Yeah. Oh, it'll be a good one. You ought to come back for that one. But listen, follow the cloud, not your emotions. Your emotions are notoriously unreliable. That's right. That's right. Some days you're on spiritual highs. Other days you're on spiritual lows. Other days you don't think you're even spiritual. And if you haven't felt that way, you haven't lived. <laughs> Follow the cloud, not the almighty dollar. I've often said to you before, you've heard me say it from this pulpit, the best things in life money can't buy. Right. Money might buy you the best bed. It might buy you one of those beds where you can set the... I sleep in number eight. <laughs> you know, I, whatever. Money might buy you the best bed, but it won't buy you a good night's sleep. That's right. You can toss and turn on that $10,000 posturopedic bed. Yeah. Whatever. <laughs> or your mattress is free. <laughs> <laughs> Follow the cloud, not your job. Follow the cloud, not your spouse. Follow the cloud, not your kids. Men, leaders, follow the cloud. Amen. You know why men are linguini spying today? Not only because of the politicalization of the feminist movement, and you listen to it sometimes, <laughs> but because, amen to that. Remember, eight got on board. But you, but you need to understand something. God is who you give answers to. Amen. Follow the cloud, not your job. Follow your cloud, not your spouse. Follow the cloud, not the kids. Follow the cloud. I want to end with an illustration. I don't usually do this because I'll leave that to people that are more capable of illustrations than myself. But this one's a personal one, so it should touch home. If it doesn't, too bad. You can just go home depressed. <laughs> this time last year, I was in a bit of a spiritual funk. And I remember sitting at a soup plantation, which already, you already know I was, must have been ill, sitting at a soup plantation. <laughs> Why would anybody? There's no meat there. But anyway, so you know, you know I was already ill at a soup plantation. So I was sitting with my wife at soup plantation. And, and I said to her, I says, you know, I says, I, this may not sound very sure of myself, but I don't know what God wants to do with me right now. And I went to a church up in Oregon that you all thought I was helping. How many of you remember that? I candidated for it. You say, well, you weren't honest with us. Of course I wasn't honest with you. I didn't tell you what I was doing. You say, well, preacher, you're the preacher. You're not supposed to get like that. 
Well, I'm sorry, but I get like that sometimes. I went up there, and I needed to go up there for God to convince me that the cloud was still here. Had the cloud moved, I wouldn't be here today. And so I was wrestling in my spirit, being honest with my wife about it, and just saying, listen, I don't know what God's going to do up there in Oregon, but maybe we just need to get out of California. My reasoning again, right? Maybe we just need to get out. Maybe we just need to get out of the environment. Maybe we just need to do something different. Gas is cheaper. Yeah, up there they pump it for you. It's even better. But I spent a great weekend with that family up there. Made some good friends with the grooms. They told us about a story about Bigfoot, which was well worth the trip in and of itself. And on our way back down, I was convinced where I needed to be. Amen. Right here. You say, why? Cloud didn't move. Amen. Cloud didn't move. Now, sometimes, God will put you through a season to prove you. Because if I would have moved when the cloud didn't, I don't know where I'd be that year later. Maybe not even in the ministry. And many a preacher gets like that. And sometimes gets, you know, jumps ahead of the gun and all that kind of stuff. And they ruin their ministry like that. I know many a pastor that have stopped becoming pastor, stopped being the pastor of their church because they felt like it was God's will for the president of a Bible college. Yeah. And so they quit their pastorate. See, God doesn't call you to be the president of a Bible college. God calls you to be a pastor. Amen. If anything, you ought to be the pastor and be the, be the president of the Bible college. But I saw many ministries just totally go under. Why? Because the pastor thought, well, it would be great if I'd be the president of the Bible college. See, the cloud didn't move, but they did. Amen. Let me say something to you, Freedom's Way. If the cloud's here, and God is speaking to you here, then you have no business being anywhere else. You say, well, I got a problem with this person. I got a problem. Work it out. Be a man and woman of God. So I got a problem with something you preached on. Well, let's go toe-to-toe on it. Let's talk about it. <laughs> you, you got an issue with something I said? Let's, let's talk about it. I will talk to you about anything I preach and show you from the Bible I am right. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm wrong, I'll confess it. Listen, some of these folks here, the gallon has been this 12 years. They've heard me say from this pulpit, I'm wrong about something. I'm not too big that I can't say I'm wrong about something. If I'm wrong, I'll tell you I'm wrong. I've got no problem being humble occasionally. (laughs) But listen, follow the cloud. Amen. Don't follow emotion. Don't follow family. Don't follow friends. Don't follow feelings. There's some of you that have been part of churches for years and it's hard for you to leave. Why? It's hard to recognize the cloud moved on. It's hard to recognize that. And the cloud is sitting somewhere else now. For some of you, you need to find a church and stay at that church. Yeah. You need to stay there. Why? Why? Because you need a shepherd, not shepherds. I only know of one shepherd. There's not many gods. There's one God. There's one shepherd. And then God gives you a shepherd and your sheep. Stay in your pasture. Feed what the shepherd provides for you. Accept the chastisement of the shepherd via the word of God. Amen. And be glad that God spoke to you.